Hi, I'm Steve Meyer. I direct the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. I'm a philosopher of science and a geophysicist by training. This is a class about the theory of intelligent design. It will parallel the content of two books I've written on the subject, Darwin's Doubt and Signature in the Cell. In the class, I'll describe the scientific basis for the theory of intelligent design. I'll respond to scientific and philosophical objections to the theory, and I'll explore its possible metaphysical and even religious implications. You may have heard about the idea of intelligent design as the result of some controversy about it in the media. I was part of one of those controversies a little while back. In 2004, I submitted an article to the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. That's the oldest peer-reviewed biology journal in America. It's uh, published out of the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History. Uh, the editor there, Richard Sternberg, sent the article out for peer review. The article was advocating the theory of intelligent design as the best explanation for the information required to build new animals in a period in the history of life called the Cambrian Explosion. Anyway, the article came back with uh, recommendations to publish contingent upon certain revisions. I made those revisions, and the article was published in August of 2004. It was quiet for about a week, and then after that, the lid blew off of the Smithsonian. Letters poured in, emails questioning the editorial judgment and demanding censure of the editor. Uh, they took away the editor, Richard Sternberg's office, his, his Smithsonian colleagues did. They took away his keys and his access to scientific samples. He was also transferred away from a friendly supervisor and given an office near the museum directors where they could keep an eye on him. Soon there was an emergency meeting of the society that oversaw the publication of the journal. The president of the society told Sternberg not to come to the meeting, even though he was the editor of the journal. The president told him that he couldn't guarantee Sternberg's personal safety, that tempers were running so high. Eventually, a senator had to intervene to save his job at the National Institutes of Health, where Sternberg had a joint appointment. Apparently, people from the Smithsonian had pressured the NIH to fire Sternberg. Eventually, he was demoted, and he left the museum when it became apparent that he really couldn't get any science done there anymore. Now, the irony of all this, according to the Wall Street Journal, which covered the story, was that Sternberg wasn't even the heretic. The heretic, they said, was that guy Meyer out there in Seattle, referring to me, the author. Now, in addition to the Wall Street Journal's coverage, the, the, uh, the story was covered in the Washington Post, on NPR, and in most of the science press. It was hugely controversial, and it was one of the first uh, controversies about the theory of intelligent design that made it into the press. Unfortunately, this isn't an isolated case. Uh, I've had other colleagues uh, who have experienced censure or abridgment of their academic freedom because of their advocacy for the theory of intelligent design. Here, here's a more recent story that illustrates the same point. It's the story of Gunther Beckley, a leading German paleontologist with scores of peer-reviewed publications in paleontology. He's had species named after him because of his discoveries in the fossil record. Anyway, about 2009, uh, Beckley began to read some books about the theory of intelligent design. He did that because he was at the time the spokesman at the Stuttgart Museum of Natural History for their 200-year anniversary celebration of Charles Darwin's birth. It was a huge Darwin exhibit. Uh, Beckley had put together an interesting display where he had the origin of species on a, on a, uh, a scale of justice on one side, and then books on intelligent design on the other side of the scale of justice. And he piled up several of the better known books. His point in the, in the exhibition was to show that Darwin's book outweighed them all. Well, he made a mistake, as he explains it, and that is that at the prodding of a colleague, he actually read some of the books on intelligent design and found that they were quite persuasive. Several years later, 2015, he finally announced his own support for the theory of intelligent design. The next year he was told that he wasn't welcome anymore at the Stuttgart Museum of Natural History. He was taken off research projects and exhibitions that he had helped to, to found or create. And realizing that they couldn't fire him, the museum directors pressured him to leave. Uh, Beckley, 
like Sternberg, realized he wouldn't be able to get much science done, he ex ended up accepting a moderate, modest severance and left the museum. So my question is this, what is the theory of intelligent design and why is it so controversial? And why does it elicit such determined attempts to suppress it? Well, I'm a proponent of the theory, so let me give you a definition of the theory, a definition that most of us who hold to the theory would accept. According to proponents of the theory of intelligent design, intelligent design is the idea that there are certain features of life and the universe that are best explained by an intelligent cause rather than an undirected process, such as natural selection. Now, some in the media and scientists who oppose the theory have defined it quite differently. For example, in 2005, there was a controversial court trial in Dover, Pennsylvania, and many in the national media uh, covered this trial. And according to people in the national media, intelligent design is a faith-based theory, and secondly, a new attempt to smuggle creationism into the public schools. In fact, there was a Time Magazine cover story that described intelligent design as a faith-based idea. Now, I'll show in this class that intelligent design is based on developments in science, the, and therefore it's not a faith-based theory. It may have faith-affirming implications, but it's based on scientific discoveries. Discoveries like the digital code that's stored in the DNA molecule, discoveries of the miniature machines and circuits that are, have been found in cells, and the discovery of the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics that make life possible. I'll also show that the theory of intelligent design is based on a standard scientific method of reasoning, in, in, including a method that Darwin himself used in The Origin of Species. The other thing I'm going to talk about is that the theory of intelligent design is actually not a new idea at all. It has a, mo a new and modern manifestation based on these new scientific discoveries, but it's an ancient idea that goes all the way back to the Greeks and to the Roman philosophers, it was also a foundational idea during the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th century in particular. In fact, the idea of intelligent design, many historians of science will tell us, actually made science possible because the early scientists assumed that the, the universe had been designed by a rational intelligence. And because of that, they believed that nature was intelligible to other rational intelligences such as ourselves. Nature had been designed by an intelligent mind we should expect to find evidence of law-like regularities and discernible designs in nature, and therefore, people like us ought to be able to uh, study nature and learn from it profitably. In addition to this, these early founders of modern science thought they, thought they saw evidence of that rationality, of that intelligence in nature. Kepler saw evidence of rationality in the mathematical harmony of the laws governing the solar system. Boyle thought he saw evidence of intelligent design in some of the exquisite mechanisms at work in chemistry and physics. And Newton saw evidence of intelligent design in the match between the optical properties of light and the structure of the eye. A couple years ago, I was asked to testify before a commission called the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. The U.S. Commission was investigating what they called the possibility that there might be viewpoint discrimination in the teaching of biological origins. I was called to testify about the theory of intelligent design, which at that time and still is not taught in American public schools. Now, after explaining what the theory was, one of the commissioners started to ask me what seemed at first to be a series of very aggressive questions. But then he kind of took a little more sympathetic tone and asked me if my theory wasn't actually quite similar to that of the theories of Johannes Kepler and uh, Robert Boyle and Sir Isaac Newton, the early scientists who helped get science going. I told them that it was, and that uh, I described a little bit more about why, and then my opposite number at the hearing interjected. And she said, well, it's true, she said, that Newton uh, believed in intelligent design, but he took great pains to keep his ideas about intelligent design, his religious idea of intelligent design, separate from his science. And this is what she said. She said, Newton made very, a very clear distinction about how science should work. Newton's view that was that we should understand the natural world solely by using natural processes, she said. And Newton said this for religious reasons, she claimed, because he didn't want God's existence or God's transcendence to be tested by the base methods of science. Now, it turns out that that's just historically false. And I was able to 
uh, cite some passages from Newton at the, at the hearing, which showed that he built his ideas about intelligent design right into the, the very structure of his scientific work. In fact, in the general scolium to the Principia, which is arguably one of the greatest works of physics ever written, Newton wrote the following. He was talking about the fine-tuning of the positioning of the, of, the, of the planets in the solar system. And this is what he said. He said, though these bodies may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, yet they could by no means have first derived the regular position of the orbits themselves from those laws. Thus, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Now, in the hearing, I was able to paraphrase a bit of that quote and to make the point that Newton didn't separate his science from his ideas about intelligent design. He made arguments for intelligent design right in his scientific works, in the optics, and then again in the Principia, which was, as I mentioned to the commissioners, one of the greatest works of physics ever written. So what happened then to the idea of intelligent design? Why does it appear that so many scientists today regard it as controversial if it was so central to the foundation of science itself? To answer that question, we'll need to know more about what happened in the 19th century. And we'll need to know more about Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. And in particular, how he attempted to ex explain away the appearance of design in living systems without invoking an actual designing intelligence. That's what we'll look at next. But for now, I'd like you to read the prologue in Signature in the Cell. We'll see you next time.